Like, I just thought it'd be sick to get hit by a car. The part in John Wick 3 where Keanu enters the stables and wheels a horse around and then cues it to kick. And then I was in that part. I got kicked in the face by the horse and fall down. <laughs> And then Keanu runs around and uh, kills some more dudes and jumps on a horse and takes off down the street, trick and fancy horse riding. And that um, skill has been uh, progressed in my family for well over a hundred years now. Yeah. And number two reason that they die is by suicide, yeah. which is, you know, obviously mental health related. Why do we feel so disconnected from each other in a world that's so connected? And that's a conversation that's been held a lot, but we need to go deeper and we need to figure out why, especially young people now, feel so isolated from communities and families and their peers and what's what's going on. I, I want this film to be a reason that we start having more of those conversations, you know? All right, welcome back to Be Frank Podcast, episode 35. Today, we have a special guest from Los Angeles that uh, he's an actor, he's a stuntman, and that he has a movie premiere coming into a Death Center Film Festival uh, I believe this Thursday I will be watching that movie for the first time. And then he's a lead actor on that rhyme of, uh, What Rhymes with the Reason, Gatling Griffith. Welcome to the show. Appreciate it, man. Thank how you for you, How are you doing, Nate? I'm doing good. I just showed up to Oklahoma. Uh, I love your guys' state and your city, and I'm uh, super stoked to be here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, like, uh, this microphone is not that sensitive, so you want to be, like, a... Uh, I'll be like right a up one on fist it. side, one fist like a distance to be a close, but <laughs> okay. yeah. But like people who doesn't know about you, like can you kind of introduce yourself? And that I I like to ask the question like if you are building your website today, what your bio will say? He's a Scorpio. No, <laughs> he, uh, let's see. He uh, raised in the film industry. My dad's a stuntman. Um, our background, our specialty is dealing with horses in a stunt capacity. Um, and I've been acting since I was like five, six years old. Yeah. Um, got an agent back then. I kept going on all these stunt auditions for my dad's friends and all the coordinators, stunt coordinators. And they'd be like, yeah, the kid's just too small. But uh, he's got like a cute look and he's got a somewhat all right personality. And so I got connected with a, a commercial agent, I think when I was six. And then my mom would just drive me to auditions. Um, my, I owe everything I've done to my mom because she'd have to drive through L.A. traffic, mm. which is what, like three hour round trip in yeah. the time that the auditions were, you know, 5, 6 p.m. And uh, and yeah, I, I went on probably like 50, 60 auditions before I booked something. And then once I booked it, it kind of things just kept coming. And I, I got to work a lot as a kid. So. That'd be a super long bio to have on my website, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but that's that's kind of who I am: stunts, acting, uh, horse work. You said fifty auditions, like um, while you were a kid. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd probably estimate it was something like that. Like uh, in a year or something, or like to till get the job. Yeah, over the course of the year, probably like fifty auditions before I booked anything. I was I was and still I'm pretty shy and I think I really as a young kid six you get sent in a room without your parent in front of all these people and they start asking you questions you got to develop some social man kudos to you and the, your parents right I mean like what was your like do you remember those like 50s like do they say hey no 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 or like a, was that like a kind of like as a kid like uh yeah, this is this audition. It's fun. Like, I care at all, bro. I was like <laughs> playing my Game Boy to the audition, and then yeah. put my Game Boy down and go read about Taco Bell, and then I'd get out and play my Game Boy again. So it was it yeah. was water off the bat. Like I didn't. It didn't matter that much. The, the, it wasn't until like I booked something and started working. Yeah, and I got to have the onset experience, which I love so much. Where yeah. I was like, oh, oh, I should. Oh, this is actually like a lot of fun. I should. I should put maybe more intention and and focus behind this. Huh. What was the first gig as your stuntman? As a stuntman? Yeah. Uh, that would probably been, uh, well, I've been riding horses since I was young, and I didn't get to incorporate that in the stunt work until a little bit old, but uh, I think I was like, I, I was six, six or seven, and I played Helmet Boy on some sitcom, and a stunt coordinator friend of my dad was like, hey, I need a kid about your son's age. Do you mind if I bring him out? And I think the gag was, I'm walking by a pool as Helmet Boy, and then this dude just chucks in her football and hits me in the head, and I fall into the pool and almost drown. And uh, so that was my that was my first stunt gag. <laughs> That's awesome. So like I saw like your um, picture, you um, 
standing on your hand, like a hand doing the handstand on a horse, right? Mm -hmm. So like, how how did you like? Does your dad did it, or like, did you just come up with it, or like, what was like, your thought process of doing that? So that is called trick riding. That falls in the realm of um, trick and fancy horse riding, and that um, skill has been. Uh, progress in my family for well over a hundred years now. Me and my mm. brothers are fourth generation trick riders mm. um, for my family. So I was just born in a great place at a great time where I get to learn from my dad who learned from his dad who learned from his parents. Um, and that's basically equestrian gymnastics. It's using your body and your weight and movement and force and physics in a way with the horse as it runs around an arena. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like a dance between the horse and the performer. They're both performers. Mm. Um, and that's actually how my dad got into the stunt business was through trick riding. He, um, he had kind of done some stuff in the 80s here and there, but his big break came when he was doubling Antonio Banderas in The Mask of Zorro back in 98. Um, and if you watch it, it's been listed over and over again as like one of the top stunt sequences, especially with horses mm -hmm. that's been shot just because he was able to bring such a unique skill in trick riding and just kind of half uh, pun intended free reign with it to be able to perform um, these kind of unseen things. Cause such a unique thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think it translated really well over the screen and it made Antonio Banderas look badass. So all in all, it was a good, <laughs> it was a good way to break in. That's awesome. Like, how do you like practice or like, how did uh, your father taught you? Like, so like, obviously, like, I don't know, do, does he just say, Hey, try to stand on your ho horse. <laughs> like, like what's the process? Like, do you like a practice? Like like a mechanical horse, a mechanical horse, or whatever. That would be cool. <laughs> Honestly, it's like um, when you're doing it as young as we did, you're learning the trick riding and the riding of horses together. Uh, and there's also a hierarchy of tricks that you learn. Yeah. So you learn something like the secret trick, which okay. is not super secret. We do it all the time. You can see it, <laughs> but it's like you learn. What does that look like? <laughs> you're on your horse. Yeah. You throw your leg over. You step down, touch it with your left foot still in the stirrup, and then you get back up, and then you throw your leg back over. It's it's a much easier demonstration with a real life horse. Oh, but okay. That was my <laughs> attempt at that. Um, but you learn something like that, and that teaches you maybe how to keep your body um, on the side of your horse and balance, and it teaches your horse because your horse is learning how to hold you and how to perform in the same way that you are. Oh, I didn't, I didn't uh, think of that. Horse has to practice too then. Yeah, absolutely. The huh. horse in trick riding is as much a part of the dance as you are because it's got to understand how to hold you when you're in certain positions. When it takes the corner at the far end of the arena, mm -hmm. you know, it's starting to lean. So it's got to, it's got to practice and know kind of the physics of your tricks. And you can't just jump on any horse anywhere and do the things that we do. It, it's very much a partnership. That makes sense. How, how do you train the horse? Um, you just kind of, that same hierarchy of steps that help us learn trick to trick to trick also teaches the horse how to, you know, it's an easier trick and then it's a slightly harder trick. And then we might move from the saddle to tricks behind the croupers, mm -hmm. which are, uh, like two, uh, half circles that are on the back of our saddle that we can grip and do groundwork and kind of interesting stuff from behind the horse. Yeah. Um, so that might be something that's like a second tier there's no tiers this i'm making it seem super formal <laughs> it's like that's something you have to progress in is that like uh you know like a uh, you know try to train like dog like say when you know like teaching dog to sit or whatever hey sit and then they sit that they give you like a treat or something yeah is that the same thing yeah we horse? definitely use a reward system for sure like our number one saying on the ranch is pet your horses like whether, whether they've just completed something that you wanted to pet them, or if you're just warming up, walking around the arena, pet them. Like we're all about, because trick riding demands such an intense connection with your, your performance partner, your horse. Um, there's most of the time we're in positions like upside down or underneath the horse or in front of it or vaulting on the side that we have no control over the reins. Mm. And it's just our voice and our trust that is keeping this performance going. So I think all in all, we have a, we have a deeper connection with our horses that, you know, some other specialties might. Huh. Do you ever get injured? 
doing that trick horse riding? Um, I've actually been injured way more playing sports than mm. I've ever done trick riding. Um, I mean, you get banged and bruised, but knock on wood, I, I've never had a super severe in- injury trick riding. I mean, I've had horses fall over me. I've had horses flip while I was on top of them and tumble over me. I've had plenty of wrecks where a horse might turn back just as we're getting to a fence and mm-hmm. throw me into the fence. Um, I've had a lot of really close calls, but overall, one thing or another just works out. And I'm able to save myself. Huh. That, what is that like a training regimen? Like, do you, how, do you train every day or do you, like, how long do you train? It's really only, me and my brother's got so much stuff going on. We, we really only focus in and hone in when there's an actual performance or something that we're preparing for. Got it's you. not really something we keep up day to day, hmm. but when it is time to train, it's like six, seven days a week for, it depends on how many horses we need to get going, but like four hours, five hours a day. Wow. So like, uh, is that just working with the horse or like, do you do like cardio or strength training or like, is that something? You're so gassed by the time you're done trick riding. Cause yeah. it's a, it's a sport that is so high adrenaline yeah. that it, it kind of like, take something from you that's deep yeah you know it's like a tendon and it's like a it's you're just physically exhausted after doing it so yeah. usually that alone is enough to get you in, in shape, shape. Well, okay that makes sense and then it's kind of like similar to like a fight camp right like people like who fights like uh, they train like a little bit yeah. but when they fight camp like it like, trains like 12 weeks and get into the cage or get into the fight right are you so, talking about ufc yeah like ufc MMA or something like, yeah uh-huh. But like, is that kind of same thing? Like you take like, okay, there's a show coming up or eight weeks out or four weeks out. Like, how's that? How's that work? Yeah. I mean, you want as much time as possible, but I'd say if we have a big show coming up, it depends if it's like a one performance or we've done the Fort Worth stock show, which is 30 performances over the course of like 16 days. Um, that one you want to be training at least like six to eight weeks in advance. Mm. If it's just a one show kind of thing, you might be able to get away with like four to six. Mm. But that it's, makes sense. it's consistent. Like once you're doing it, it's like, like I said, six to seven days a, a week. Huh. Is this like a trick writing kind of stuff is kind of like a rest, similar to wrestling? The, the reason I bring up the wrestling is that I, I didn't wrestle growing up. So I was training for MMA fight and all that kind of stuff. Then, you know, when you start wrestling and then... You, 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 when you wrestle with the people who wrestle throughout the high school and the junior high and middle school and whatever, you kind of can tell that, okay, I'm not a wrestler. <laughs> but, like, I can get better. But, like, the people who has been doing wrestling from since they're a young kid, like, it's just not, right? Cause, but, like, a kickboxing or something like that, it's kind of like, okay, they've been doing this for the entire my life, but it's kind of you don't have that gap, right? So, like, my question is kind of like, Trick writing because you started at such a young age so that you have it. But do you think that people like want to do trick writing when they're like decided like 18? Hey, I'm going to get into this. Mm. Is that going to be like a wrestler kind of type of situation? Like it's too late or like it's it's possible. I think like the main component to that, especially in, in trick riding, is there's this element of fear. Like it's an extreme sport. And so when you're doing it as a kid, that awareness of just how dangerous it might be, you're not really fully compre- comprehending it. You know, it's just like it's normalcy because that's what you do. Mm. If you were to try to get into it later on in life, uh, totally possible. But um, you have to be... You'd have to be an adrenaline junkie, <laughs> I feel like. Um, and, and wrestling and trick riding actually have a, a, a similar connection because it's all about navigating your own body weight. Yeah. You know, you can, you can be a smaller dude, but if you know momentum in physics and you are strong with your own body, like do a lot of pull-ups, push-ups, you, uh, it, trick riding is the same type of way. You yeah. just need to be able to yank yourself from spot to spot. Do you do pull-ups and push-ups? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but like I said, trick riding is usually enough of an exercise that when you're doing it, yeah, it's you don't need to go home and do a whole lot afterwards. That makes sense. And then like you say, you how did you? So you say your father got into uh, like war stunt man, and then you said that um, uh, you wanted always wanted to do the car stunt stunts, right? Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. Yeah, so 
growing up, like at the top of my stunt list, for some reason was always car hits. Like I just thought it'd be sick to get hit by a car. And I started like putting that out in the universe. I was like, hey, hit me with a car, someone somewhere. Uh, and I filmed a, a car hit with my dad. My dad uh, came up with a Mazda 3. We padded it all up. It's on my Instagram, and I just... I saw that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I got hit by a car, and then I just posted it because I was like, maybe I got to take the first step in this whole process. And then after I put it up there, one thing led to another, and it was a very random occurrence. I was on set with a stunt coordinator, and he was like, hey, how tall are you? I was like, 5'7". He's like, can you be 5'8"? I was like, I'm 5'8". He's like, uh, <laughs> he's like, okay, there's this guy that might need someone uh, for a car hit. And then that's how I got my first one. And then I just did another one on uh, the new Joker film. And so now it seems to be that I'm, I'm elevating my career from the thing that I really want to do, which is get hit by a car. <laughs> so like, uh, how, how does that stand work works? I guess like, did you, so like, uh, when people, it's kind of called stunt double, right? Like, uh, the actor comes in, you dress up like it and then I like, kind of, yeah, you do that day of work. Yeah. Yeah. Now when you're doing stunts, you can be someone's double, um, but there's plenty of need in the film industry that there's just stunt people. Like if you're going to just drive your car and hit somebody with your car, that person getting hit doesn't have to be an actor that's being doubled. It can just be a stunt actor. Huh. You know what I mean? So it, it really depends on the ask of huh. the project. So what do you think about like um, AI and the green screen, all that kind of stuff is going on, right? Yeah. So like... Uh, there's like a lot of things that you can do on the CGI and all that kind of stuff. Do you think that stuntmen will be there forever? Or like uh, once like AI takes over, it's like a safety issue and all that kind of stuff and the movie industry might not use a stunt people anymore? That's a really great question. It's something I've been thinking about a lot. I don't know. I think we have another... I think we have another 20 years for sure where real stunts are being done. If you look at it, something like John Wick, the John Wick series, um, part of what makes it so great is the practicality of it and the getting your hands dirty and not relying so heavily on a CGI or um, a volume set, you know, stuff where they can just kind of fill in the blanks from their guys in post. Um, I think that as... AI maybe develops and is able to replicate some of the stuff without actually having to do the stunts. I think that projects that do the stunts may become more valuable and and may prosper because of their willingness to go out on location and get their hands dirty and do the thing. Hmm. But but like you're saying, like liability and stuff, I don't know. Um, I hope that um, filmmaking in that way where and it's not just about stunts like the filmmaking process of being on location and having to get the stuff right on the day like you're not going to be able to fix it in post i hope that process stays alive because that's for me the fun of it is being with creative people in a collaborative environment and figuring out how to get this thing done together mm -hmm. and not relying so heavily that somebody in the editing bay a year from now will be able to fill in all the cracks. Yeah, that's kind of sad, huh? Yeah. They take it away. So you work with uh, Keanu Leaves for John Wick? Yeah, yeah. We, um, I, I was helping out my, my dad, Tad Griffith, um, and Scott Rogers were coordinating the sequence. And it's basically the, the part in John Wick 3 where Keanu enters a stables and wheels a horse around and then cues it to kick. And then I was in that part. I got kicked in the face by the horse and fall down. <laughs> and then Keanu runs around and uh, kills some more dudes and jumps on a horse and takes off down the street. Yeah. Uh, and we shut down a play, uh, street in Brooklyn and goes into some cool trick riding um, with two motorcyclists, two or three motorcyclists coming up on either side of him. So our responsibility was just, uh, he had done a lot of horse work before us, but getting him comfortable on our horses, the ones that were going to be doing the sequence, and creating this cool rig system that uh, helped safety him as we were going 30 miles down a street of Brooklyn at night uh, next to two motorcyclists. Damn. Did you get kicking in the face? No, no, no. <laughs> See, that's where CGI comes in handy. So you didn't actually have to do that. I was like, <laughs> damn. That's... Shot in. <laughs> that's a one day kind of deal. <laughs> what, what was it? What was it to uh, work it, working with uh, Keanu Leaves? Oh man, he, he's, he's just the best. Like he's, 
the most sincere, authentic, hardworking man that I know. Like I'm, I'm his biggest fan. Yeah. Like, um, he'd sometimes call us and be like, Hey, I might be five minutes late to training. And then he'd, he'd end up still being five minutes early. Like that was just the type of character he had, you know? Um, always like hardest working dude. Like I know he'd have to go from guns to driving to martial arts training to us with the horses but was so steady, calm, and consistent that you, you'd never know how much he had on his plate. Um, just a guy I look up to a lot. Huh. It takes... Okay, so I guess he doesn't have a stunt double. He does it himself? He's, he has a stunt double, but 90% of the stuff he's doing himself. Like, if you watch the John Wicks, they make, you know, Chad and the team make a, a very strong effort to show that this is Keanu doing long oneers, kind of a Jackie Chan type thing. You know, Jackie Chan would just sit there on a wide yeah. and let the action play out yeah. and then make sure that you in the scene with him with his face and screen to show that it was him the whole time. <laughs> kinda, I think they're doing something similar and that's a testament to the skill that Keanu has to develop, you know, uh, the, the cardio and the, and the expertise it takes to do a 45 minute jujitsu knife scene mm. and does not cut, you know, that's, that's because they do so uh, as much prep as they do. Damn. That's, that's crazy. How how much they so they have a in the film said they have an expert trainer trains like a, each different field I guess yeah yeah they they you you bring in your experts in certain fields and they they have a kind of like a different stunt coordinator will be responsible there's just so much action in such large sequences that it'd be crazy to have one stunt coordinator looking over everything uh-huh. so they'll have guys that are responsible for getting. Uh, sequence a done and sequence b done and sequence c done and and kind of like smoothing out everything so it feels like it's all in the same movie huh that's awesome i mean i always wonder you know like i do a lot of uh commercial work and advertising stuff and i'm big fan of uh doing multiple takes Mm. for as a step man do you have in the contract say you, I'm going to only do, <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask. Yeah. Like, a, I'm going to only do one take. Or like, is that something in the contract? Or like, is that something like, oh, maybe I got three in me. Like, like what is the process of like doing the same take scene? Like, do they have to have a multiple camera set up? Like, is that a director's request? Or like, you just do whatever they say? You're going to do whatever they say but you're going to hope that your coordinator has your back yeah. and comes up front and says, Hey, Mr. Director, man, woman, this is a really hard hit. Can you please make sure that your cams are in the right place yeah. and you guys are actually rolling and you know exactly what you want so we can do this in as few takes as possible? Like if you're doing, I don't know, we've been talking about car hits. If you're doing a car hit, if you get it one time and it's great and everybody's safe, let's just shoot it one time. Make sure that your camera's in a position. Make sure that you know where your beginning and end mark is. But, you know, it just depends on who's leading the team, who's your director and who's your DP and how well prepped they are and, and how good they are at imagining what's about to unfold before they actually see it one time. You huh. know, because it's kind of hard to rehearse certain certain big gags. Do you ever have those like, oh, I can't do it anymore moment? <laughs> um have I ever had a I can't do any more moment? Not yet. Um, give me a few more years, and I'm sure I'll start feeling like that a little bit more. But yeah. as of now, I'm like, I, I like doing those big, those big. I like the adrenaline. I like the thinking about it weeks prior. I like yeah. the performance of it. I like doing big act. What is that? What is that like? Your mental stage, or what is like, like what are you thinking? Like whenever your car is coming at you, right? Like is like what is. What does that go through? Like uh, before that night, like do you pray or like like what is your <laughs> what is your process? What's my ritualistic <laughs> process? Um, like do you ever think like oh this might be it or like it's like this is just another day? Like what's your what's your deal? And you know I don't have the personality that's like this is just another day. Like I get worked up and I care a lot about my work. Yeah. Um. I've I've really made it an effort to practice gratitude before stuff like that because it's easy to get in your mind. It's even easy to feel like imposter syndrome when you're the guy that's in the big spot and you're like, oh, why did I get picked to do this? There's I know so many more athletic guys than or this or that. And then you really have to be like, well, regardless of of why I'm here, just 
just taking the time to be like, well, I'm so thankful that I do have this job and I'm so thankful that I do get to work with this person. I'm so thankful that I get to be a small part of this larger project, this larger creative collaborative boat that's moving forward. Like I really just try to sink into gratitude so that I feel like I'm supposed to be in some of the spots I've gotten to be in. Huh? That is awesome. No, nah, thanks. I love that. Uh, so, um, what if somebody, let's say senior year of high school, somebody in the high school kid say, I want to be a stuntman. Hmm. What steps they can take to be a stuntman? Like if they are in a, like Oklahoma or something like that, yeah. do they have to move to LA or like, what is the process that to be a stuntman? You know, as many people are in the stunt world, that's as many journeys it took to get there. But as far as like providing some practical, tangible steps that could be taken, um, start watching stunt reels on YouTube, especially if you can find somebody that's working now an older stunt reel. And because that means that they were probably in a similar position, especially people that have come from outside the industry that just broke in. Find out who those people are. You know, look at the credits on your favorite stunt movies. Look up their interviews, look up their IMDb, see what they started doing. A lot of people, young people, the first thing that they really need, well, they need to have the want to do it and they need to be developing the skills it takes, whether that's a specialty thing, like I just wanna drive cars in the movies or I wanna be a part of a fight team, I wanna do cool action fight sequences, like focus in on those guys that are doing that already and then start looking at their older reels, if you can find their stunt reels, like their demo tapes that they put together and just start studying how those tapes are put together. Cause it doesn't need to be like you're renting out a hundred thousand dollar camera and you're showing yourself doing all this cool stuff. What a lot of coordinators are looking for is just seeing that somebody's a good fighter, like seeing somebody that has skill or somebody that has the guts to take a hard hit. Like they want to know that you're committed to this thing. So I would say, look at people that are doing the thing that you want to do and then start looking at how you might be able to develop filming your own stunt reel. Hmm. And that's even before you have to move out to one of the big hubs like L.A., New York, Atlanta. And, and plus, Oklahoma is a developing film community as well. So, yeah. I don't know, hit up your local filmmakers and just tell them that you're around and you want to learn and you want to be on set and you want to be a stuntman. Yeah. I mean, Oklahoma is kind of growing, right? And then, like, the Dead Center is big. And then now you guys have a What Rhymes With Reasons going to be in premiering this thursday this thursday yes yeah. but this this will air uh next friday so it will already aired but you, you should have seen it, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> you should get, go go whatever and then i'll probably say that was an awesome movie but i haven't watched it this moment but uh tell me about that movie what rhymes with reason is uh, it's a coming of age um movie about a group of friends um, going on this journey together, all the while each of them has um, something that they're working to overcome or push through. And, and we find that um, friendship and, and opening up and being vulnerable with each other can kind of deepen the relationships that we might already have in our lives. It's about a lot more than that, but one, that's one of the, the key themes that we're, we're focusing on is, is friendship and discussions based around mental health. What did you play in that movie? I play um, the young man that kind of calls all of his friends together to go on this journey. Uh, my name is Jesse Brandt, the thing. Um, and it's, it's kind of my voice that it has just gone through something um, super emotionally impacting early on. And I feel this call to, to lead my friends on this, this big adventure. Which means we got to do a cool adventure film and travel all around the state of <laughs> did Oklahoma. Did you do stunt a lot? Uh, did I do any stunts on it? Uh, no, there was like maybe like two or three things that <laughs> yeah. kind of called for a little bit of stunt thing. But uh, uh, there's a fall off a river at some point. I don't think that's a spoiler. There's a fall off a river uh, and Kyle wouldn't let us fall off an actual river. So. But you wanted to? I wanted to really badly. <laughs> I was like, let's just find like a 20-foot river and let's jump into it. But it didn't work out. Something about insurance, I don't know. Yeah, maybe you're the only one wanting to do it. Oh, yeah, the, but uh, I was curious. Okay, going back to scent, though, like I'm just curious. So if that's like, a, you, if you get hurt, right, is that like a movie pays for it? Insurance pays for it? Like your insurance pays for it? Like how does that work? We're going to get into insurance on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a... <laughs> It, as long as you claim early on that you got hurt on that set and yeah. you can kind of like show some proof, yeah. it's the movie's responsibility for the most part yeah. to help pay for it. You might have 
co-pays and stuff from your personal <laughs> insurance, but it's the movie that's uh, ultimately, if all things go well. Is that uh, like a stuntman's insurance is super high? It is higher. Yeah. you. I think most stuntmen get their insurance through SAG. Like yeah. SAG has a... SAG is able to work with stunt people more because they understand the business and they gotcha. understand what, you know, the risks. Yeah, you have to put it as like, hey, my profession is stunt, I yeah, guess. Okay. exactly. That makes sense. But uh, so uh, how did you um, got this role in this movie? Like, did you get a script or audition or you knew Kyle? Or? You know, I knew Ricky Masler, the casting director. Mm. Um, I've known her for well over a decade. She cast me when I was probably 10 or 11 in this scary movie. Mm -hmm. Um, And she has just been a constant supporter of me throughout my career. Like I stopped doing acting when I reached high school and uh, I didn't think I'd get back into it. And then college came around. I was like, maybe I'll give it another shot and started going to some acting classes and I fell back in love with it. And, And it was Ricky that when I was getting back into it, threw me some bones and was like, hey, I got your part on this thing, or hey, would you read for this, or hey, I had somebody I want you to meet. And that was kind of the same situation with with uh, this film. She mm-hmm. introduced me to Kyle, and we got to talk in, and he just felt like we were a good match, and I could play the character that he had in his mind in a way that worked for him. Um, so it was, it was really Ricky, at the end of the day, that got me connected to this project. Perfect. Did you read the script before you like audition or something like that? Yeah, yeah. I read the script. Ricky sent it over. Me and Kyle chatted about it, and I actually, I actually just talked to Kyle, and he felt like I was the right fit before even having to audition, which was a first for me. Mm-hmm. Um, which is weird when you don't audition because you're like <laughs> waiting the whole time. You're like, what if I'm a, not at all what they thought I was going <laughs> to be like? What if I'm a huge disappointment? And so you have all those thoughts. But but Kyle, um, Kyle and I got connected super early on and we were able just to have creative conversations and jump ideas back and forth and kind of like really feel what Jesse was like far um, before getting on set. So it was, it was a pretty comfortable environment. What is it like to play high school kid? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Just not getting any sleep and studying all the time. And it was, it was, it was hard method work. Um, <laughs> no, what do you mean? I mean, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't view my lives in chapters like that. Like I was a high school kid and then I was a college kid. Like it's, you're still the same person, like whatever environment you're going through. So yeah. I really didn't try to like focus in on being like a high school kid. I was just like, what was I going through and feeling at that time? Given these circumstances, like I try not to put too much pressure on character that way. Yeah. That, um, so this rhyme of, what rhymes of reason is about the mental health, right? Yeah. So, like, uh, I think that one of the interview you were talking about this is like you went through like um, you know depression and anxiety and kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, like, what was it like, and how did you kind of overcame it? I think, I think I've been I've had bouts of depression in my life since I was very young, but I didn't recognize that's what they were. And it kind of came to a head when I was in um, college and I was in my third year and all of a sudden the world just came kind of like crashing in on itself and nothing made sense. And I was having trouble finding meaning about anything. And, and it was, I was at a really low point. Luckily I was living with a best friend of my, a uh, best friend of mine and my brother and they kind of took care of me. Um, but I got help and I got on medication, I started going to therapy and I started like reviewing some of the ways I was thinking about the world and myself and I started doing some work and it helped me come out of it. Now, I, I still get bounce of anxiety and depression. Uh, like it's not like it's a, I don't cure that. I don't see it as being like something that's a sickness that you have to get rid of. Like it's something that I live with and is a part of me. Uh, but this film, putting that on the forefront of something it wants to talk about and be about I really connected with early on. I was like, I would love to be a part of a project that specifically talks about mental health and and is hopefully going to act as a conversation starter for families that see it, you know, whether it be a family that goes together or a parent that sees it or a kid that sees it and sees people talking about the issues that they might be going through or their kids might be going through. I, w- I would love for this just to, if it only affects a couple kids, if it only affects a couple families, that's what we wanted to do was just be a conversation starter for other people that might be going through the stuff that the kids in this movie are going through. 
I love that. I mean, like, I think Kyle told me that, like, I think number two uh, reason uh, the uh, teenage suicide is a mental health and, like, a depression or something like that. I think that... Yeah, I think it was the, the number two killer of kids of a certain age. Yeah. The number two reason that they die is like, by suicide. Yeah. Which is, you know, obviously mental health related. Yeah. Um, it's a kill. Yeah, it's a it's a major killer, and it's only going up right now. We mean we need to have more open conversations about what it is, why it's here, why is it growing so much now? Why do we feel so disconnected from each other in a world that's so connected? And that's a conversation that's been held a lot. But we need to go deeper, and we need to figure out why, especially young people now, feel so isolated from communities and families and their peers, and what's what's going on. I I want this film to be a reason that. We start having more of those conversations, you know. Why do you, why do you think that is? I think it has something to do with the technology. That's not a new stance to have, but there's something super weird and deep about going into your screen and viewing the world and viewing people and viewing what life's supposed to be like through this, you know, four by six electric panel, mm-hmm. and then br- that that has such a strong pull to get you out of what real life feels like, tastes like, looks like. And I think that whole situation of that disconnect between what it means to be alive, I don't know. It, it, I don't have all the answers, but I, I feel like technology is, a, is one of the main reasons why we're feeling so isolated today. It's kind of like social media is like pros and cons on a lot of things, but, but like that is kind of... Mm, Big question right now. It's like, how can you censor the social media? Or should we censor? Like, what is that just a mentality thing? Is that people has to have control of like what social, what media they can consume? You know what I mean? Because you can watch uh, what rhymes with reason, and then you, people might get inspired and they change life. But people might watch something different. And then they may, they might get depressed, and then they might commit suicide. Like, where do you? <laughs> some steps there, but yeah, yeah. I mean, like that's kind of truth, right? I mean, yeah. what what do you say to that? You know, do you have an opinion about that? It's tough, right? Like, if you put ten people in a room and tell them each to censor themselves, like, what if somebody really does not have the skills that? are needed to censor for themselves. Whereas somebody else can put time limits on, knows exactly what media they should be consuming and shouldn't be. Do we just force the other people to develop those skills, even if it means we lose some along the way? I don't know. That's a really, that's a deep philosophical question that I don't really have answers to. Also, like you have to say, you have to define what's good and what's bad, but like how do you define what's good and what's bad? Right. I think there are overarching things that we can agree on, like large scale. We can agree that very vulgar, murderous things are not cool. We can agree that, you know, um, a bunny jumping through the meadow is cool. And then, <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's easy to divide out. Yeah. And once you maybe get into the minutia about, like, political stuff and what should be, I, I don't know. There's a lot of smarter people that are already having these conversations, and I think it's important. I will say for myself, like, I've decided that, I have a time limit on all my social media apps yeah. and the passcode for it. I don't know. My brother knows it. So once I hit like 45 minutes on social media for the day, I'm out. I can't, I can't go out anymore. Cause do I know, you use I know. The app? Huh? Do you use the app to like control it? Or? No, it's just screen time on your iPhone. Like you can select all the apps that you want to no longer be able to view after a certain time limit. And then after that, there's a passcode that's required and I don't know it. So I can't get it on anymore. Cause I know myself well enough to know that, if, if, if all it takes is a ignore and to continue on, I'll do that. Like, that's just <laughs> the way my personality is wired is like, right. if I'm into something and, and watching something and I just feel like I'm going to keep watching it, I'll just keep watching it. Like, I don't have that type of um, discipline that it takes to be able to, oh, I'm at, I'm at 30 minutes. I'm going to myself choose to put my phone away and not be on anymore. I don't, I don't have those, those lines drawn, whatever it is about me. I just have a hard time doing that. So I know that I need the time limit mm. uh, factor. Hmm. That's awesome. Um, so what do you think that uh, those kids doing that, uh, going through that stuff, do you recommend that or do you have anything else like a recommend to do? I, if people are going, 
Like you mean as far as the social media and not being able to get off? Oh of it? no, I think like a depressions and okay. anxiety and having like a bad thoughts. Yeah, I I would highly recommend getting professional help. First of all, people that this is their mission in life that they found is to help people in those critical situations. If at all possible, get that professional help. I'd also recommend, and even though it might be super scary and super hard, there's no better feeling than feeling like you can open up to the people closest to you. So although that's a very scary first step to say, hey, mom and dad, or hey, bro, or hey, sis, can I talk to you about, about something very important to me? And being able to share the dark feelings that you might be shameful about or that you think nobody else is feeling, something that you think is wrong with you and you need to hide once you take that first step and realize that you can expose those things to the people that are closest to you, if you can, like there are people in situations, really bad situations, really bad family environments that can't do that. I totally recognize that. But if you can, I think just being open and honest with the people that are closest to you is a great first step in, in, in recognizing and acknowledging that you, that you are not feeling well, that you need help. What if they can't? Well, then I'd go professional help. Uh, there's lots of services like counselors and stuff that um, are are free of charge or cost very little. Insurance is, you know, insurance in this country is insane. But there are routes like online. Like if you just look up a therapist near me, like I guarantee you there's going to be ways that you can get connected with someone. And there's, there's nonprofit organizations that offer counseling to people if you can't afford it in the t- traditional route. Um, so just just look for somebody to talk to because that's the main thing is just being able to talk about these things so they're not trapped away and caged away and festering inside your own head. What was it for you? Like, uh, you know, like you mentioned that first step to say, hey, hey, bro, I have a problem, right? That's like a first step. But like what made you take that step? It was, it, it was, just, a, it was just too much pain. And I just realized I had started thinking really dark stuff and I was able to just to have enough space to be like, I don't want to be here anymore. Like in this thinking situation, I either need to change it somehow or I can't deal with this anymore. So I, I, it was just basically being forced to do something Mm because I didn't want to feel that way anymore. And that's, that's kind of when I, I had my brother and best friend live with me. I had my to supportive parents, mom and dad back home that I could talk to. I luckily had like a very strong support system of people that wanted to hear those things and wanted me to get better and were supportive. And, uh, and so I was able to, to recover, uh, mm. in, in, in a, in a pretty good way. Hmm. It's awesome. That, uh, so how, so I think Giselle, she's going to be on this podcast on Thursday. Sweet. I think I'm going to ask her how was, uh, working with you so i'm gonna ask you the same thing maybe we'll put together some little she's gonna be like i just kept getting lost in his eyes you know i, I could hardly remember my lines <laughs> <laughs> no she won't say that she definitely won't say that um ah giselle's great man she's she's got a, a a lightness to her that she carries around wherever she goes and it just makes everything feel super smooth and comfortable like there's never, it doesn't feel like she ever is bringing this like weight around her. She just makes everybody around her feel like, like light. That's how, that's, that's the word that keeps coming back. It's just, she's just got like a angelic presence about her that, um, makes working with her super fun. And she's got a great outlook on life. She has a really strong work ethic. She's multi-talented. She can sing, she can act. I think she can dance. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's a queen, bro. She's the best. <laughs> that's awesome. What's, well, uh, I mean, I think that uh, I got to thank the Tony Mello, the makeup artist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she, uh, she was on here, and I've, I, I've known her for a long time, and then she talked to you, and then she's like, hey. And then, like, she helped me out, and then I have you on this uh, podcast, and I'm very uh, thankful for that. Yeah, uh, so Tony's thanks, the Tony. go, bro. Shout out to Tony. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I, I do ask this question every uh, podcast episode. Uh, to the end of segment that, you know, I ask, say, what advice you give yourself five years ago? So 2018, what were you doing? 2018, first year of college. Ooh, buddy, uh, let's take a breath, man. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do all the things that you imagine yourself doing right away. Yeah. Like I've always been 
an ambitious guy, but sometimes I pile up too many things on my plate and I get overwhelmed and shameful when they don't all happen on my timeline. So for me at that age, I would just, I would recommend, and I would, in five years, I'll recommend it to myself now because I still haven't really learned it. It's just, it's just breathing and having the patience that, that the things that you want to occur, if you believe in them and you stay consistent with them and you have faith in them, like everything they want's going to come to pass. You just, you just have to be patient and know that your timeline for the stuff is not real. It's like made up. Yeah. Like if you want to do some, keep, keep going after it, but don't, don't put hard dates on the stuff that you really care about. Yeah. It's a, it's a hard question, right? Because People say put the deadline, but don't put the deadline, you know? Just, I think it depends on the person. Yeah. Like if you're the type of person that needs to be pushed like that, yeah. then you need a deadline. But if you're the p- person that's already pushing yourself super hard yeah. and you're hard on yourself and you feel shame easily and you want a lot, yeah. maybe you're the type of person that needs the opposite advice. Yeah. Like, I don't think one one piece of advice sticks for everybody. Yeah, and also like a one, that advice can go good for somebody like in certain situation and then like it just depends it's just the crazy things that you know just like sometimes you're saying about like host writing show or something like that you have like eight weeks prepare Mm -hmm. you focus that's probably good right because if you don't have that show you're probably not practicing right but it's good to have a deadline yeah but like in life you don't really have to have it but it's so funny to me because a lot of people I ask that, you know, give you advice to yourself five years ago. Some people say, some people come on like uh, last week, the guy who is like a, over probably 50 years old and then he's like, yeah, don't take yourself uh, seriously. That's that's my advice to everybody in blah, 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 right? I think, I believe it. And then uh, yesterday or somebody came in here and say, I... I have to take a life seriously. Hmm. And then I was like, hmm. But content is content is different, but it's just like both are saying the right thing. Absolutely. But it's totally opposite of things, right? They're talking about take it seriously, don't take it seriously. I was like, I think that's why it's interesting to me. That's why I think that social media things we're talking about or movie thing we're talking about, I think more of the knowledge you have, more of the option you have is a probably best way to approach life than you can pick and choose. Yeah. Maybe. But uh, what do you, what do you think about, well, how do you see yourself in five years? <sighs> more peaceful, <laughs> <laughs> more happy, more content. Like I, I, I started thinking more in terms of the ways I want to feel moving mm-hmm. forward than the things I want to do just because I've always been focused on the things I want to do. And I've realized those don't bring me a lot of happiness, or if they do, they're short-term happiness. Like, I just want my life to be one where I'm compassionate towards myself and towards others, and I'm doing things that I feel like are important for myself and others. Like, I, I want to become a better person than I do, like, want to do certain things like I I want to be a filmmaker I want to keep making my films like I've been writing and directing for some time now I have a short that I really care about that I'm getting funding for like I'm doing those things as well but underneath it that deeper ocean that's at play I want to be more at peace in that way than I do um a a checklist of things that I want to have done by the time I'm I'm 24 29 you know what makes you happy like making movie makes you happy or what what makes you happy making movies is dope yeah (laughs) yeah but i'm also into my meditation like heavily and i want to keep getting more connected with my spiritual side i want to find the child within myself again something that i feel like i've lost the last couple years like i i have like deep work that i want to get done alongside being able to go out and make cool fun play in movie wise with my friends yeah so yeah i think i think managing the this, the the short term stuff in our life that we can tittle around and do, and then that deeper spiritual presence that we all have, finding the balance between feeling fulfilled and both of those is kind of a life's work. Mm. Do you meditate? Yeah. Like, do you use an app? I do. I use Headspace, Calm, Me too. and Waking Up. Yeah. I use Headspace three. I kind of have tried out all of them. Yeah. Uh, Which one's your favorite? Headspace, if I'm just going to meditate, Headspace is my go to. 
I love Andy's voice, very calm, very <laughs> relaxing. This app called Waking Up, which was des designed by Sam Harris, mm -hmm. is a bit deeper and has philosophical conversations and really goes, like, it's too smart for me, but I still try it out anyways. He, like, brings on some of the top minds that talk about, like, free will or the ethics of morality and, like, stuff like that and really kind of forces you to think deeper. Yeah. A lot of times I get uncomfortable thinking about that stuff. But if I need to calm down again, I'll go back to Headspace. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just find out about the Headspace because I was just going to YouTube and say, like, type in, like, 15 minutes of meditation or whatever. Yeah. And then, but... Just find out, like, I think four or five days ago about Hitspace. Mm -hmm. And I like that Hitspace has, like, a, like a four-day streak, like, five-day streak. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I'm, like, doing that every single day. And, then, okay, I'm getting stuff done. I guess I'm kind of that kind of person. I just need to know I'm doing this every day. Yeah, yeah. That just makes me wanting to do more. <laughs> Bro, one time I messaged them and I was like, hey, is there any way I can turn off, like, the streak thing on my app? Because I don't like the pressure of, like... Oh no, I'm going to break my 32. Cause then I'm like thinking like, Oh shit, I got to keep that streak going. I got to keep that streak going. And they were like, no, just <laughs> ignore it. If you don't like it. I was like, all right. I was like, I guess that, uh, you know, if I'm meditating, I should become less stressful around those, those areas. of like, stress. So maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a way to practice. Yeah. That's funny. Cause that works for me. That works for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, is there anything else that we didn't cover than like wanted to mention? No, we even got spiritual at the end there. Yeah. We've covered the acting, the stunts, what rhymes with reason, the mental health. Um, I, I think that's pretty much all I have to bring to you. Oh, no, I mean, you got a lot more. We just have to talk about those four things. Unless today. you want me to start interviewing you. Uh, you can have your own <laughs> segment here. Yeah, you can, you can ask me whatever. But uh, yeah, how people can uh, find you. I'm on, uh, my phone number is, no, <laughs> my socials are, uh, I'm Gatlin Griffith on pretty much uh, all my socials. Um, yeah, that's me. Are you like uh, uh, active on Instagram, Facebook or whatever, like all of the platform? Or yeah, Instagram. I kind of got a millennial personality about me. So Instagram is kind of where I'm more active. I'm not on the TikTok. I, I see it and I know it's going to consume me if I jump on it. So I've been hanging off of that. Yeah. Are you a TikTok guy? No. Okay. I mean, I have a TikTok, but like, I don't really touch it. My uh, person post it for me. That'd My be good. Person <laughs> it. Good. Good. Yeah, Stay so away from I that. Don't, I don't really do that. Uh, Instagram and the YouTube, that's a, that's a two platform I post gotcha. uh, frequently. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching uh, this episode. Uh, be Frank Podcast, episode 35. And then if you're watching on YouTube, please support Gatlin in the comment and then say what you learned about this and then what you want to know about more and then uh, like and subscribe to all that stuff and if you're listening to uh, just a podcast streaming st s service like Spotify or Apple iTunes or whatever and then give me a five-star review and then I think helps but I don't know what happens if you give me a five-star reviews, but I think it does help. So, uh, well, if not, I uh, appreciate you guys sticking around and then listening to the conversation. And then I'll see you guys next Friday. Peace. Thank you so much, man. Thank you.